When one looks at a fund fact sheet, it would often include a portion on the risk one is assuming by investing in a specific portfolio. For balanced portfolios, asset managers express the portfolio risk in conjunction with the degree of equities included in the portfolio. Do these measures work and what are some of the issues investors should be taking into consideration? Nassim Taleb, in his book, The Black Swan, talks about those risks we can control and those that are beyond investors' control. How should investors deal with these and what should be considered on that note gentlemen welcome once again to WealthQuest uh, as mentioned before controllable risks and uncontrollable risks systemic risks or specific risks I mean those are really some of the rhetoric that we hear from investors out there but perhaps we could start off with a definition in terms of what risk means to investors yes there, there are risks that are out of our control and um, risks that we can um, measure and to some extent uh, um, try and alleviate. Um, risk generally is n never completely, um, uh, you, know, you, can't, you got, can't avoid it, you're always going to have some kind of risk because as soon as you're investing in anything that can go up and down, you're going to have risk and most asset classes or investments can go up or down. So um, generally one, one uses the term diversifiable risk and undiversifiable risk. Diversifiable risk is the kind of risk that you um, can mitigate by having lots of shares in your portfolio or various fund managers in your portfolio but that only works up to a point because once you own all the shares in the market you are left with the undiversifiable undi risk which is the the general market risk so markets the on average go effect essentially that would be over and above that because yeah. even if you've got market risk there could still be um the the uh Talib kind of risk, which is the credit crunch or the, yeah. those kind of non-forecastable events that happen over and above general long-term market risk. So a good way, I mean, a good way to put this, and Raran, please correct me if I'm wrong, because he, he's, he is the quant here, okay, <laughs> so, and this, I mean, this is a hairy topic. Yeah. Undiversifiable risk is also, in my, in my terms or in my life, would be what's called beta risk. So it's the risk of actually being in a specific asset class. You want to be in equities? Well, guess what? You're going to have to get used to lots more volatility than being in bonds or cash. Um, the undiversifiable risk, um, or should I rather say the diversifiable risk, is the fact that you can own not just one stock, but you can own 20 or 30 stocks, and potentially that could make the portfolio less volatile than just owning one stock. I mean, it, is that, would that be a good... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, if, you, uh, if you're saying equity risk, you, again, we've we got to be more specific than that in saying, are you looking at all share risk or SWIX risk? Those are different equity indices that mm -hmm. capture the stocks in the market in a slightly different way by having different weights in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the research that, uh, that we've done shows that the all share index is actually a very concentrated index. Um, so you can, after... 30 or 40 stocks, you probably eliminated most of the, the market risk, whereas the SWIX is less concentrated. So um, as you're adding stocks, the risk diversifies mm. away up to a point. Yeah. So let's look at, at diversifying within asset classes, because if we perhaps have a balanced portfolio per se, mm. where you've got equities, you've got portion in cash, you've got portion in bonds, mm. you're diversifying away from a specific asset class, which mm. could ultimately mean that you're canceling, canceling out some kind of risk going forward, or some of the risk at least. And the problem, and I mean, yes, in theory, that's yes. quite correct. But the problem that you've got with that is that most of that is measured by what we call correlations. So if the one asset class moves up, to what degree does the other one move up or down? Now, guess what? Most correlations are historical. Uh, most standard deviations or most measures of volatility or dispersion is all historical. And this is, uh, this is Mr. Taleb's point in the black swan. And by the way, it's not just him that makes that point. There's many other people that made that point before him. And they're saying, well, that's all very well and fine. And we've got a great mathematical model and we understand historical returns, but it tells us nothing about one event that could potentially wipe away a half of your wealth or a quarter of your wealth. Mm -hmm. But I mean, how do you hedge yourself against those kind of risks? And I actually posed this question to you before. Do you then buy protection? Is that what you do when volatility becomes too hot to handle, Roland? Absolutely. It's, it's like insurance. If you want to insure your car against loss or, or theft or damage or whatever, you have to pay a premium every month to insure that car. Now, what you are doing is you're just passing on that risk to the insurance company who diversifies that out by having lots of potential customers out there that won't fail when your car is going to fail or, or, or need to be replaced. Um, when it comes to equity markets, um, the, uh, the, the kind of risk that, that, that Taleb refers to is the, the, you know, the, the best way to avoid the credit crisis is to not try and forecast the credit crisis, but to actually 
buy protection all the time. Yeah. Now, obviously, that costs money and it will reduce your, your returns in the long run. But the only way to avoid risk in advance is to to pay for it, to pay for protection to, yeah. to uh, hedge yourself. And, and I mean, and, and, and the interesting thing is that just make sure the counterparty doesn't go bust on the other side of the trade because otherwise you've got, you thought you had protection, but you actually got no That's protection. That's what happened in the credit crisis. Absolutely. Well, you, you know, know, they say that time heals all. And it's amazing what we've mm. seen that, you know, during 2008, 2009, mm. we've seen markets reach their lows. We subsequently bounced quite nicely off that. Yeah. So if you have been invested in the market over, say, 10 or 15 years and you didn't sell out prior to the crisis, you're still sitting at a really Relatively positive position, isn't that so, Kirby? Well, S&P 500 of the last decades. Yes, we know S&P and down. Not to the South African market. Not point six one percent. We've done well in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, in South Africa, the yeah. returns are more on the JSE all share now, and I'm not looking at the total return index, but yeah. it's probably more in a 12 and a half, 13 percent rate, and that really is quite nice for South African investors because you've had this equity block, which is invariably the thing you look at for growth, and it has actually produced growth, which is fantastic. Now everything kind of hangs quite nicely. All the volatility numbers and all the risk numbers and all the return numbers all hang quite nicely and your own equities because you know you're going to make money out of it but unfortunately when you look at America and you look at the Europe for instance that hasn't been the case over the last decade investors are actually poorer today than what they were a decade ago and that's quite quite a quite a tough pull to swallow regardless of what the risk number looked like in the beginning of the decade and that's why when one looks at a fact sheet you've got to be quite clear as to what you're looking at and what the different numbers mean Okay, well, it's been fascinating because perceptions of risks have changed significantly. If you look at it at a macro level, it seems that emerging markets um, offer less risk than the developed world purely because of the debt overhang that we've seen. How have perceptions of risk changed, Roland, over the past while? And how would you say that investors are looking at it now? Because we know it's quite theoretical and we know that there's a modern portfolio theory and other theories out there that substantiate how people view risk and invest and play on risk. Well, risk is cyclical, so there are going to be decades or periods in, in time where you're going to have risk clustering in the sense that Kirby mentioned the word correlation early on. If everything's highly correlated, like in a strong bull market or in a strong bear market, you actually have high um, uh, sort of uh, volatility in the sense that everything is moving in big jumps, whereas there are times when, when things are less correlated. Um, that is when you get higher benefit from diversification. So you will find like during the credit crisis, correlations went through the roof. Everything was correlated. So whether you were in bonds or equity didn't make, the, suddenly your, your diversification benefit went away. Um, and then when there are periods when you know, things drift in all sorts of different directions, that's when you get uh, the, the benefit from, from uh, having multiple asset classes and within different asset classes, different risk exposures or risk factors. And these kind of things change over time. Um, from from the correlations inherent amongst these. Uh, it's also it's fascinating what we do right now mm. when we speak to investors. We talk about strategies. We talk about what's what um, you know investors are pricing mm. in by way of macroeconomic scenarios that will ultimately change the way that whether you're going to be uh, reweighting your mm. portfolio and heading perhaps into construction and selling out of retail if you're bullish, mm. and then holding onto some of the safer stocks relative to what um, the the riskier assets are are creating at this point. How do you gauge what to do at this point in time, Kirby? Is it about sitting down with strategists and saying, well, this is what the risks hold going forward on a macro level, and mm. this is how we're going to play the markets? You see, for me, um, the very first question that needs to be asked from a portfolio construction perspective always should be, is there a reason why you should be owning the asset class? Is there a valuation argument for owning an asset class? If there's a valuation argument for owning an asset class, by all means, then the diversification element becomes appropriate to, to, to go and have a look at. And the diversification element has got to do with the correlations, the volatilities, what kind of risk are you assuming for being in that asset class? Because quite frankly, if you're diversifying for the sake of diversifying, but you're not actually going to get any bang for your, for your proverbial buck, what is the point of just diversifying? then you may as well not own it. And that is the point that you've got at the moment, for instance, in the market, is that people are diversifying, not necessarily for the sake of return, but just diversifying because they think they're potentially diversifying way risk. Risk is a historical number. And I'm saying some historical numbers you've got to take with a pinch of salt and some historical numbers you can't take with a pinch of salt. With regards to qualities of risk, two types of qualities, if I'm not mistaken. So you've got risk factors and risk premia. Take yes, us it's, a, those. it's a very important um, distinction within risk because we, you know, when you have a problem like risk, which is this big 
white elephant, you've got to start biting at it in smaller chunks to try and break it down. So if, if you um, have a look over here, you can see that we've actually tried to graphically illustrate the, the two types of risk qualities. Um, at the top here, we have something called a risk factor. And all we're trying to illustrate here is that um, it, it contributes noise or, or, or volatility to your portfolio in the sense that this could be the currency. So the RAND has an impact on your portfolio. At times it will have a positive impact and at times it will have a negative impact. But what is interesting about this risk factor um, is that it's a, a poor quality risk because over time you're not getting any benefit from that other than noise and volatility. There's no positive expectation. The RAND will aggregate out, you know, the positive and the negative influences will average to nothing over time. Whereas the second type of, of risk is called a risk premium and uh, that kind of uh, risk will have a um, ex higher expected um, return over time. If we look at the, the bottom part of the graph, we can see that uh, the second type of, of risk is a higher quality risk. It's called a risk premium. And the way this uh, is different to the top graph is that, yes, you are still getting volatility from exposures to something like the equity market. You know, equity uh, stocks go up and down as, as a whole. Um, but you're getting a positive expectation. You can see that the, the average there is above zero. And that could be, for the equity risk premium example, between 4 to 6 percent per annum. So equities are a good risk because you are getting a higher return despite having the volatility. Whereas with these risks, you are not getting any excess return over time. Um, there are other types of risk premiums such as value investing. Value investing is a valuable way to add returns to your portfolio, but it does include also cyclicality and positive and negative uh, influences. Emerging markets, small caps, all these kind of things are higher paying risks. Um, now, if we look at the, the following slide, we will see that this is quite important when it comes to benchmarking um, skill in terms of how fund managers deliver uh, returns in their portfolio. So how does risk uh, come into benchmarking? Well, here's a common kind of uh, mandate that a, a fund manager typically tries to manage in a balanced fund. The, the, the benchmark, if we can call it that, is 60% in equities, 30% in bonds, and 10% in cash. Now, we know that uh, equities delivers between 4 to 6% more than cash, and we know that bonds, on average, deliver 2 to 4% per annum more than cash. So how do we outperform this kind of benchmark? Well, it's actually very easy because if you just go overweight equities and put 70% in equities and you sort of leave it there, you are getting more of the equity risk premium, not because of skill, but just because you are having a higher risk portfolio. And we can't give credit to the manager for having uh, to be uh, given that as a, as a skill credit because they are just assuming a higher uh, risk with higher equity exposure. So we have to strip that out. So all I'm trying to say here is that um, don't think that uh, a return above this kind of balanced fund necessarily a skill. It could just be more risk. Okay, well, that's quite interesting to note. I mean, you mentioned, um, uh, Roland mentioned there, the bonds, equities, and cash play at this mm. point in time. Is there a risk-free asset class? I mean, we know that U.S. Treasuries, prior to the crisis, was deemed as risk-free. We know mm. we've got various issues with the U.S. debt ceiling and so forth and, mm. uh, you know, questions about uh, default. Is there a risk-free asset at this point? I know ETFs mm. perhaps are perceived in a sense, in that way. Yes, they've got market volatility and they've got market risk, but perhaps are, um, you can extrapolate the, the systemic risk from them. You see, the thing is, if you're trying to model asset classes, then you have to use a basis for a risk-free asset. So that's the, this is the theory now. The theory says, where's your starting point? Well, your starting point should be cash, which is a risk-free asset. And if you're going to base it upon U.S. Treasuries, then that was always deemed as the, the kind of asset that can't default. Life has changed since 2009, as you know. Okay, and we're busy going through the Greece crisis, the Greek crisis, as we speak at the moment, and it's a major, major problem. So the question is: Is there really an asset class that is risk-free? Absolutely not. Everything has got risk attached to it. And this is, I think, uh, Nicholas uh, Taleb's point in, um, in 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 the Black Swan is how do, you, how do you even control these things? Because we know that over every decade, there's going to be an event that changes the face of the investment environment. Let me give you a classic example of this. 
Um, in the 80s, a concept called value at risk became really, really, really important. Why? Well, we had this 1987 uh, f a financial crisis, or the, or the, or the stock market crash, I'd rather say. And on the back end of that, of, of that crash, you saw people trying to quantify risk. And all of a sudden, it became a prerequisite from an accounting perspective in order to understand the kind of risk that you're assuming. Now, VAR is quite an interesting concept because it's got two components to it. It's got a time component to it, and it's got a probability component to it. Yeah. And it tries and understands both of those, and trying to understand, you, you're trying to give the, the, the reader a, a, an opinion about the kind of risk that you're assuming and over different time periods. The problem is that with all the VAR calculations that we've had and with all the VAR inputs that we've had, when the financial system cracked in 2008 and 2009, it meant nothing. It became meaningless because the VAR numbers went ballistic. They went through the roof. And that that was supposed to help control risk wasn't really even controlling risk. And this is George Soros's point today. Yeah. George Soros is sitting down and saying, well, is VAR really the way that we should be thinking about risk? Isn't there a different way? And by the way, that's Talib's point as well. Mm. There should be a different way that we're thinking about risk. I mean, you take everything that Roland has said now, and all that is right, okay? But that all depends on a certain relationship holding between equities, bonds, and cash over time. Yeah. So I love, I love what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, as uh, market commentators allude to risk on, risk off trade. Yeah. Uh, we see risk priced in and some of the risk that hasn't been priced in. So we know that markets are forward looking. Tell us about what is happening right now with some of the risk, uh, the trends with regards to risk and uh, risk premiums, risk return. We know that there's, of course, a trade off between the two. The, um, the different types of risk at the moment are, well, risks are always going to be there, but they are at different times, different types of risks are more prominent. So we have things like sovereign risk at the moment, which is your whole uh, Greece, Spain, Portugal kind of risk. We have um, uh, value risk is probably at the moment quite cheap. So you can actually price risk. You know, risk can be expensive or cheap, and value is cheap, whereas sovereign risk is quite expensive now. Currency risks are also playing, uh, not in South Africa perhaps, but uh, uh, around the world so these kind of things are always present but you need to understand how expensive or cheap the risks are not the stocks but the risks 